Tony from Buildium here, the platform that activates property managers to own their everyday operations, make the residents feel at home, and take on more doors. Welcome to How to Take on Multifamily, a three-part video series featuring multifamily expert Tony LeBlanc of Ground Floor Property Management in New Brunswick. He's also the recent author of The Doorpreneur. How are you doing today, Tony? Doing very well, Tony. How are you doing? Uh, so good, so good. And, and I'm really, really excited today because we're going to be talking all about multifamily property management and specifically the video series, the three-part video series that we're doing has to do with taking on multifamily property management. And since you're an expert in that, it's great to have you here. And also you wrote a, a book recently called The Doorpreneur. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yes, uh, The Doorpreneur was uh, put out in November of last year. So it's basically a culmination of 43 years experience of me growing up um, as my mother's sidekick in the property management industry to me running uh, my company for the last 10 years and success successfully spinning off uh, multiple new business opportunities within the management company. And it's now been the base of the Doorpreneur way, which is basically being able to take a property management company, spinning off many businesses or multiple business that service the management company, and then taking those services to the general public um, for future and bigger growth and what could probably be done just in the management company. So it's been uh, it's been an exciting ride. Now, this first first part of the series, we're talking about the multifamily mindset and what that really means for property managers who are small business owners. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that usually doesn't mean for a small business owner uh, a luxury multifamily, right, Tony? That's correct. Yep. Typically, we see um, in the multifamily, even in the startup phases, are, are, are typical B, B plus type properties around, and that's just about in every other city in North America, starting from as small as a sixplex um, all the way up to a 12, 24, and 32 units, generally for working class people every day. Right. And so, well, what's interesting is that although we might not be talking about luxury, it's still a, a very lucrative way, a new side of your business that, that many property managers could get into, even if they're just doing single family or maybe they're just doing a little bit of multifamily. That's, so I'm curious. Uh, it's good, great to talk to you about how to get into it here. Yeah, absolutely. What do we really like mean as far as the terminology? Like, What are the different terms that you usually hear uh, in multifamily that you might not be familiar with if you're, if you're not in it? Um, some of the standard ones. So typically we, 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 even the one that we just kind of threw out there, a class B, um, that may be unfamiliar to a lot of people that run single families. So typically I know in our area, we, we run things from a class, let's say a C, B to an A. So an A is usually, um, a brand new higher end property. B is kind of like your working class. C would be uh, on the lower end uh, of the spectrum. Then we got terms like duplexes, which represent uh, two units within a property, triplex, you're going to have three units, uh, quads, and then you typically from there, we'll just go into the number of unit counts. So a six unit, 12 unit, 24 unit, and all the way up. Yeah. And that's uh, it's great to get a couple of those terms uh, rattling off. And I know that there's a lot more to learn <laughs> there. So another big part of multifamily, it's like, like I said before, it's a very different beast. So how do you, yep. you know, how do you sort of internalize that? Like, how do you um, like identify that difference? And like, how do you know that it's right for you? I know for us personally, when we, uh, luckily at one, the way that I grew up in, in the property management industry is I was surrounded by probably larger multifamilies, but throughout my career of running my own company, we've had the pleasure of managing everything from a single family duplex all the way up to the biggest that we had was 124 unit, huge multi-res. Uh, multi and some of the big distinctions that I found between running the smaller stuff versus the bigger stuff is, is really one of the key characteristics became in, in terms of the infrastructure. I find that starting out in property management, if it's just a, a sole entrepreneur kind of getting into the industry, Managing single family or even duplexes is actually very doable. It's very attainable and achievable for just about anybody that wants to get started in the business. Sure, low barriers you to entry. Yeah, you, you know, you don't you don't need a lot of staff. You don't need to be overly techie, although it always helps. Um, it's just pretty easy to do um, once you once you start looking at multifamily. 
depending on how big you get, then you're going to start running into different types of uh, maybe infrastructure issues in terms of you know staffing and office and all that type of stuff um, that you start to need to start prepping for in order to be able to handle these bigger buildings because at the end of the day, you have one roof with many people living under it instead of just one. As well, you're now being faced with having to take care of common areas. So buildings have, you know, they have common areas to clean. They have electrical rooms. They have maybe HVAC systems. Maybe they have elevators, all these different things. So it's way more complex operationally. It is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it takes a lot more to be able to kind of sit back and say, okay, am I, am I ready to handle and, and take on some of these responsibilities versus just managing Mr. and Mrs. Uh, three bedroom house, right? <laughs> right? It's, it's a bit different. Yeah. Yeah. So how does that change your team? I, I, I know let's dig into that a little bit more. I know for us in terms of the, the, the residential space, again, you can get away with, I find a uh, fewer team members to have to take care of a, a, a portfolio of single family properties because you don't have to be there as often um, on the multi-res again, depending on how big you get, um, there's going to be a need generally for cleaning, a cleaning crew. So whether if that's outsourced or if it's part of your own staff, the, the hallways, the entrances, those all need to get cleaned on a regular basis. Um, then you have stuff like leasing. Um, leasing can get to be a, a pretty big job depending on the size of the building. Um, residential world, your turnovers are typically um, a lot less than I would say in the multi ramp. So if you're managing a 24 unit building, you know, you're, you're, you're probably going to have, you know, maybe uh, a 10, 15, 25% turnover rate each year. So that means can you continuously going in there to be able to, to do the turnovers and, and leasing out these new units? And I imagine if you don't do that right, then oper- operationally, um, you know, and profit wise, you could actually take some pretty big hits very quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and as you want an owner, um, it can be a real time gouge in terms of if you're not ready for it, you can find yourself at that building quite often <laughs> taking care and, and, and playing all these different roles. Um, I know when we first started, we had to do that. It was just, it was part of getting into the industry and into the business at that time. We were, we were willing to do everything and anything, uh, you know, just to be able to be able to get stuff done. Right. You had to do anything to cut your teeth on the, uh, oh, yes. on that new, that new side of your business. As far as profitability goes and to talk about that a little bit more, mm-hmm. how does that change on a per unit basis? I would imagine it, it drastically changes. It does. Um, typically again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be doing that quite a bit in terms of comparing kind of the single family world versus a, a typical multi-res. So on a single family, typically you're charging um, a percentage or a flat fee based on the income that's generated from that unit. Now, th- there are situations to where a single family house typically, in, in a lot of markets, the rent for that single unit is going to be considerably higher than the rent that you're going to get in an apartment. So if I use my backyard as an example, for me, I can typically get anywhere from 1500 to 2000 a month on a nice three bedroom home, one and a half bath, nice neighborhood, kind of small bungalow versus a two bedroom apartment. I'm only going to get maybe a thousand out of it. So right. if our fees are based off of a percentage of the income that's generated from the property, then you can, you can quickly see that the math, you know, the, the income generated from on a per unit basis on the multifamily is going to be low, lower than a single family. But then you have the beauties of the economies of scale. So on the multifamily, I no longer just have one rent coming in. I have 20, 30, 40, 50 rents coming in. Right. So that's, that's what kind of makes up the per unit economics of that. That's just the tip of the iceberg, I imagine. And there's a lot of research that somebody has to do you know, before they, yeah. they go into it. Um, and it's absolutely market specific. The next thing I wanted to talk about was really how to evaluate your current property management business um, to evaluate it, to see, you know, where you're at today and then where you need to be. But first of all, yeah. What do you, what do you think? Like, what are the first things that come to mind, Tony, that you had to address when you were thinking about doing it? Staffing, uh, going back to that, that initial one with staffing was being able to, being able to have the infrastructure to be able to handle the responsibilities of taking uh, a larger building. So, 
um, an, a, a front desk, an administrator, uh, an, even an office. Um, while that may not be required nowadays, the more time I spend in these Facebook groups, the you know the, they're, they're kind of touting this no office and no, no paper and all this cool stuff, which is which is great. Um, but for us, when we first started, having an office was a huge part of our identity. We, we wanted to have that. We had our office um, set up. Um, also, another thing that's that's really crucial is the the connections to trades. So, dealing with a single family house, you know, it's you're, you're typically going to deal with general handyman type stuff, a lot of painting, fixing some appliances, and fixing uh, small things here and there. But when you're getting into these complex multifamily, um, you got to know different people. So you got to know, you know, if there's an HVAC system in the property, if the, there's um, an elevator, you're going to have to know if you have amenities like a pool or a gym. You got to be aware of how to be able to address all those types of things. Um, so just being aware of these new responsibilities and, and people that you're probably going to have to bring in for help is is really important. So if you, if that's, that could be something that's completely new for somebody that's predominantly been in the single family space, maybe they haven't had to, to tap into a lot of those types of resources. So I'd, I'd strongly urge you to, uh, you know, for people to, to, to t- kind of take a look around who's who, who does what, and tr- start to try to identify some vendors that they can start creating some relationships with. Right. Cause your maintenance picture totally changes, right? So that's, that's the first thing you have to understand. Hundred percent, because it's it's not uncommon for an apartment building. We have a lot of thirty-two units. I don't know why thirty-two is a pretty good number, um, but instead of having one turnover um, in the summer months, it's not uncommon for us to have five to ten per building happening at once. Right. So if you can imagine, if you've got ten apartments to turn over. That means you need you know four or five painting crews. You need general maintenance. You need your cleaners. Like it's a, it's a whole new level of scale. It's, it's, it's doable and it's easy to do, but you just have to have the wherewithal to, to be able to find those right people or uh, perhaps look at bringing that type of stuff in house. Right. And that's not even to mention the systems that are surrounding all of those people, right? Oh, geez. Yeah. Technology, technology is going to be your best friend uh, when it comes into those situations, whether if it comes to management software um, being able to manage all of your work orders, being able to manage your tenants. Um, so if you're, if, if an investor has entrusted you to manage, let's say a 24 or 32 unit building, which is going to be a multi-million dollar investment, um, you should have by then graduated out of Excel and into a proper system, i.e. something like Buildium. Um, you need to be able to manage your tasks. Properly, you need to be able to manage your again your work orders, and you need to be able to track your rents, arrears, all that stuff that kind of comes naturally in the property management world. Yeah, and we are going to talk about marketing to multifamily owners in the next video series. For those of you watching, yep. to uh, to stay tuned for that next episode. But yeah, it's it's the owners are completely different. They're not accidental landlords. They're serious no. investors that look Absolutely. at things differently, right? Yeah, and they'll and they'll hold you they'll hold you to a whole different level of um, of, of accountability. Um, a single family, oftentimes, it's kind of dependent on markets. In the single family, I find that we we more than not we're, we're dealing with accidental landlords that they may or may not want to be in the situation that they're in, but they're having to to rent out their house. But people that own multifamily in the big apartment buildings, uh, th- these are investments for them. They're, they're retirement funds. Um, they could be, you know, they could represent a, a, a various amount of things. So the accountability and the reporting that goes back to them um, is, is at a different level, but it's also, it's a lot funner for me as a business owner to be working with these real estate investors that treat this as a business. Um, we see things eye to eye they're willing to invest uh, a fridge breaking down or having to repaint an apartment or doing some upgrades. They know that at the end of the day, this is going to bring them more money versus trying to convey that same message with the house owner. Um, Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult. (laughs) Right. I would imagine there's an emotional X factor that uh, with multifamily owners um, or with multifamily investors definitely changes from, you know, the accidental landlord. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, another interesting part I wanted to, to talk about here was, you know, is how do you evaluate maintenance as a profit center, right? And and how that plays into it, since we're talking about profitability a lot here. Yep. You know, where you're where you're at uh, versus where you want to be. Like how could you how could you look at maintenance a little bit differently? Yeah, for for me, I don't know if I'm I'm, I'm lucky or if I'm unlucky, but I I, I grew up watching my mother uh, manage a, a property management company for 35 years, and they always had their own in-house maintenance team. Um, I can remember from a very early age knowing all their maintenance guys, and they were always the ones that kind of came in, and that's how they ran their business for them. Right. The owners own the buildings. So for them, it was uh, more cost effective to have their own staff versus hiring out sub trades to come and doing work. So for that reason, when I started ground floor, I immediately, my first hire was a maintenance guy. I knew that I wanted my maintenance in house from day one because I wanted, I knew the importance of it and I knew the factor that I wanted to be able to control it. I didn't want to be at somebody else's beck and call. It's two in the morning and the other guy's busy and I can't get them at the property for my problem. I never wanted to experience that. So um, with maintenance, it's it's a different business altogether. You have the business of managing properties where you make money off leasing fees and management fees. Once you introduce maintenance and you, if you do this in house, it is a completely separate business and one that can be very lucrative if you run it properly. Um, so, you know, you're, you're charging out an hourly rate, you're paying a wage to your salaries and there's, there's a gap obviously in there. And that's, that's where you can make your, your money. And in the multifamily world, again, it comes with scale, right? The more units you have, the more turnovers, the more needs you're going to have for maintenance. So for us, it's always been uh, a, a no brainer to have our own, our own guys within our organization. Now I know I've seen a lot of other property managers where they hire trades and there's, you know, there's markups and there's all sorts of things that people do to be able to compensate for that. Um, it can work. I've seen it work for, for many people, but, um, if, if, if control quality, um, rings true to you, then I, I'd probably recommend having your own in house staff. Um, if staffing and dealing with all that stuff sounds like to be a nightmare that you don't want to get involved with, then maybe you're, you're, you're good with, you know, subbing it out to other people that they can, you know, they can worry about staffing issues and you just call them up and they show up. Yeah. I think, uh, and that's even more poignant for property managers these days because there's such a, a shortage of, you know, good vendors to work with and, and good contractors. So yes, I heard I heard an interesting story about a vanity the other day, which was interesting. <laughs> um, they they are absolutely they are hard to find, good ones and reliable ones. Now let's talk a little bit about leasing um, and how to evaluate where you where you are right now and where you might want to be, um, because clearly leasing is one of those processes that you can uh, benefit by uh, by automating more by uh, using technology. And, um, you know, also just by tightening up the process in general. So how did you, how did you look at your leasing process differently once you started getting more into multifamily? Well, for us, leasing was, uh, at, at, at the start, it was all done by me actually for the first couple of years, uh, myself and, and sometimes my partner. So, um, I know earlier on, that's probably one of the components that took up the most of our time bar none. It's like. When you get into, let's say if you're managing a class C type property, um, in our experience anyway, you, sometimes you get in a situation to where you're showing the apartment 10, 15 times before you get the thing rented. And unfortunately in the multifamily space, you don't have the luxury of doing um, keyless, or not keyless, but uh, automated showing. Oh yeah, 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 sure. Pick up a key. Um, that, you just can't do that, right? You need to be able to walk somebody through an apartment building. Um, yeah, so no self showings uh, for for safety reasons, right? Exactly, and sometimes if you're getting into a nicer building, there there's amenities that you want to be able to walk people through, right? Um, so there's there's a human element that's needed in that. So um, what was really nice for us was once we were at a point to where we were big enough to where we could hire a full time leasing agent on our staff, and that came directly because of the whole multifamily aspect. Again, the turnover rates are more frequent and you just have a lot more units. So 
it, it actually doesn't take that long before you could actually hire somebody full time to be able to handle all of your, your leasing needs. Um, but another, another thing with, with multifamily is sometimes if you're lucky, um, you can take over the management of a property and it has an in-house resident manager that lives there. They, they're kind of the eyes and ears of the property. They usually do all the cleaning. And if they're really good, they also do leasing for you. So this could be something that's actually taken care of by somebody that's already in the building, that knows the building, that knows the quality of tenants that you're looking to, to try to bring in there. Um, so that, that makes your life a lot easier. Um, we do have a few properties that are like that, but uh, we've always, our motto has been, because we manage properties for multiple investors. I have, I think at last count, we had close to 150 different owners that we that worked for us, that we worked for in our portfolios. So the old model of a resident manager in each big building, they did the cleaning, they did all the tenant relations and they did the leasing, worked well. But I find that when you have uh, all these buildings and different owners, if I have a prospect that goes to tenant A, goes to look at a two bedroom and it doesn't work, well, they leave that building and they're off to the next building visiting the next resident manager. But, but with us, we have a full-time leasing agent. So they call, we, we meet them at the building, we show it. Uh, that didn't quite work out. I'm really looking for this. Oh, well, let me look at my list. I got 10 other buildings we can go take a look at. And that has been like a game changer for us. Um, our closing ratios have you know skyrocketed because of that. It's like, if, if you don't like this, well, I got five, 10 or other buildings that I could probably, I'm sure I could find you one of them within our portfolio. So well, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and what you're talking about right there are the benefits of really that knowledge being spread across multiple po- properties in really the hands of, of one person to be able to, to help potential renters uh, find the best fit for them, right? Yep. And that's, that, that was probably the motivating factor for us reinventing what our typical resident manager did. So some of the some of the challenges that we face today, finding good resident managers, superintendents, how, there's so many different terms for them, was it's very hard to find somebody that's willing to clean a building and be the sales face of the building. Those two are those two are hard to put together. Either they're really good cleaners and they're not really good at sales, or they're great salesmen and don't ever ask them to clean because that's beneath them. So the way that we've remodeled and restructured our, our supers is that we hire for eyes and ears at the building. We want them to live there. We want them to take the calls if somebody's locked out, stuff like that. Kind of keep us, you know, they, they don't make much money because they don't do a whole lot. Then we bring in our cleaning team to clean the common areas. And then we have a my leasing agent, our full-time leasing agents take care of all the leasing. So. Instead of having that one person do everything, we now have essentially three people or three different parties doing the work and the cleaning is a thousand times better. Our leasing is much more effective and we now have superintendents that live in our buildings that are not very, they're, they're not all stressed out because really they're just kind of like eyes and ears and they'll take a few calls and here and that. So, and the, what it costs the owner for all that typically comes to exactly the same amount of money as what that one person used to do in the old days. Oh, that's really interesting. So you've just kind of, the roles have changed over time. And, you know, I know leasing and marketing has become increasingly more important with multifamilies, you know, over the past 10 to 15 years, um, but especially now. And so it's it's really interesting to see how you split up that role. And it's, it's just less boxy with, you know, thinking you always have to have a super doing everything or... Um, you know, one person, a resident manager doing everything, uh, you know, if that's not the right fit and it's, it clearly was not for you, I'm sure it's also not the right fit for a lot of other markets. So, yeah. And it's, it, it's funny cause I look at it as, uh, we had this interest, interesting discussion, uh, the other day about actually about software in, in, in the property management world to where not only property management, but almost every industry to where software is now becoming you're seeing these little startups coming up everywhere and the software that they're building is very specific to a specific need or a problem essentially and and i look at this model kind of being the same thing it's like 
I can't find that one thing that does everything really good anymore. So I'm kind of having to create or find the specialties or the, you know, the experts in each individual and kind of build them all together. And we're, we're, we're lucky enough to where all of these people are on my team. So uh, it works out really well for us. Yeah. And it's, it's true with, um, you know, with a lot of, uh, you know, specialties, the way that sort of people have gone in their careers uh, you know, you can get so specific these days about what you're looking for, and people want to do that very specific thing. Maybe it's the effect of technology on how we view our roles in society. I'm not going to get too crazy deep on that, but <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's it's a really interesting thing to to notice. And the fact that you've identified that and that you are evolving with it says a lot about how uh, you know you're able to really uh, do well in business. So that's awesome to hear. Um, now, as far as you know, customer service, we talked a lot about leasing and obviously, you know, there are other opportunities with technology to, you know, really help that process along. Obviously syndication that you can easily do with a listing and then publish it to a bunch of sites like Trulia and Zillow uh, through a platform like Buildium. Of course, there are other things that you can do with uh, other technology. What other things um, have you used technology-wise to help the leasing process? So on the leasing side, we've we've really, uh, Slack is probably one of, it's our best friend. Uh, we've, we've now standardized on that in terms of our internal communication. Um, a perfect example in, in terms of how we use Slack for the leasing components is, um, so my leasing agents, they're out on the ground. So if they have a hot lead that, okay, they, they did the showing, the tenant's like, yep, yeah, I want it, I'm good to go. Then she'll send us a quick note. We, we created a, 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 a leasing, uh, I forget what you call them in Slack, but uh, a channel, leasing channel to where um, that message comes through. So it gets broadcast to all the people that should know. So namely is my girl that takes care of all my applications. So she's now on the lookout for that app and to make sure that she gives a great service when it comes in because she's already, you know, they've already been pre-identified as a hot lead. So, okay, you know, let's, let's pick it up and, and make sure we give them, you know, AAA service. Um, so Slack's been great. Um, we've actually done some cool things in terms of um, some creative autoresponders when, when, uh, when, when people submit requests through an ad. So we're, we're big Kijiji users here in, in Eastern Canada. So somebody will go on to Kijiji, they'll, they'll reply back, yeah, I'm interested in the apartment. And I created this very cool video series that kind of gets back to them right away with an autoresponder, with a picture of me or video of me, kind of introducing them to the building that they, sh they just went and saw. And we hope that they like their tour and we hope to hear from them and join our family as a tenant president. Um, that was really cool. We got some really good positive feedback with that. Um, other tools on the leasing end, um, I would say probably Buildium the most in terms of like the lease renewal functions and, and all the capacities that it has within that. That's good area. to hear. I'd like to hear that. We, yeah, yes, yeah. We haven't gone into any um, uh, any automator or the, the, the key, the, the keyless entry, not the key, I keep on saying keyless uh, entry, self but showings, right? self showings. We, we haven't done any of that here just because I live in a city where I can get from one section to the other in 10 minutes. So I haven't lucky, really needed much. Lucky today. you. <laughs> <laughs> there's an, uh, there's an article that came out of Boston. It's like uh, Boston is essentially an hour away from Boston uh, <laughs> because there's so much traffic, not even because it covers that many square miles when you compare it to other cities you know so people here are cursing if they gotta drive more than 10 minutes to get anywhere i'm telling you it can get ugly <laughs> so great all right so we talked a lot about leasing um let's talk a little bit about the resident experience and, and one of the cool pieces of technology that you know that we hear our customers talk a lot about with multifamily and just in general is the ability to have resident portals uh resident owner portals you know resident centers and, and obviously that's the digital place, the digital area for an experience. Um, but curious, you know, how else you cultivate, you know, uh, the resident experience with your multifamily properties and other things that you do that normally you wouldn't have done for a single family? Well, it's a lot easier to create a community because now you have economies of scale. You have multiple people living under the same roof. So doing that with a bunch of single families is incredibly difficult i know we, we've tried to roll out several programs but within within a single apartment building you can actually if you have a great like resident manager 
that is there, you know, whether if they live there or they're there day in and day out, you can really get to know people at a personal level. You get to know their stories, you get to know their backgrounds and, and kind of everything that they're up to. So once you're able to, to kind of foster that community, it's a lot easier to then bring them up from the technology perspective than being able to make our lives easier as a property manager. Because at the end of the day, if somebody's toilet is broken or the towel bar rack fell in the bathroom or whatever the case may be, I want that request to come in digitally because it's, it's very expensive for us to have these things come in through a phone call because our phones in our office are ringing off the hook day in and day out. And, and there's no trackability to it because the unfortunate reality is you're on a call taking a maintenance request, hang up the phone, phone rings again, oh, it's another maintenance request, hang it up, oh, somebody came in the front door to pay their rent or to have a chat or, or whatever. You get preempted a lot. So unfortunately, it's easy to get stuff lost when you don't when you, when you take stuff verbally or by phone. So um, like the maintenance request that we can do through Buildium, like we are constantly, constantly trying to beat this into our tenants to say, okay, it's to your best interest to be able to get this thing to us electronically so that we can properly track it and we don't lose sight of it. Um, so that's that's been huge because it all lends to our credibility to them um, if we start failing them on, you know, it takes us five days to go to go fix something that's trivial, they're not going to be really happy with us. Um, and maintenance requests is probably the biggest complaint um, that I would say that most property managers have anywhere, um, or biggest tenant complaint, sorry. Um, the ability to pay rents uh, online, although we don't, we don't utilize it, I... We, we, we do it a different way, but I do see the value in being able to have all that managed by one system to where we, we you know, like we no longer take cash, right. we no longer take posted checks. We have two ways to pay now. It's email or pre-authorized uh, payment systems, and, and, and that's it. Yeah, well, the smart way to do it, that's for sure. You, you know, don't want to be <laughs> – but there are other options too. I mean, there are – for those who have to accept – cash, there's uh, retail cash payments that can still happen. Um, and yeah, there, there are many ways to, I guess, to, uh, to work that problem. Um, all right. So moving, moving on here, um, you know, one of the next things I wanted to ask you is obviously say you're a property manager looking at multifamily, you're seeing buildings spring up in your market. You're seeing like, you know, a lot of need for potential multifamily property managers. How do you wrap your head around like that uh, demand? Like how do you qualify it as a legitimate opportunity uh, for your business? So f for us, some of the main drivers that we continuously look at is um, employment. So what's what's going on uh, in your city in terms of what's what's driving or, or what's coming up? So we, and I can give you some perfect examples of what happened here over the last few years, we've had uh, TD Bank, which is, uh, you know, they had, they opened up this massive call center down here and it was employing like, a, yeah, up to like 800 people. And they were all like some, there was various executive positions, but there was a lot of just kind of medium, nice paying jobs. And that, in addition to a few other things, uh, marijuana became legal here in Canada a couple of years ago or last year. And the number of companies that are coming or that are sprouting in terms of building these 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 grow up ops and plants and all this stuff, um, our, our cities become kind of like a magnet for it. So we're seeing all this great work coming in with great work, great paying jobs comes the uh, needing uh, the housing requirements. So what we've seen is the vacancy rates over the last three or four years steadily, steadily go down, 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 down to where at the end of 2019, we, you know, we got 1100 units in my one location and we were like a 0.2% vacancy rate. And I'm like, that's insane. Yeah. And I'm like, we're, we're going to see another, cause it's for here anyway, it's a seven year cycle to where you get this low, low vacancy rates. All the builders are like, oh, well, we got to start building again. So they ramp up, they build a bunch. Uh, vacancy rates obviously start climbing. 
to where it'll take a few years to, to be able to take all that down and then it, it happens all over again. So um, we, we're, we're now in the, in the low to where vacancy rates are super low. And I know personally of probably five to 700 units that are going to be on the market later on the summer. So as a property management entrepreneur, you, you need to know this stuff. You need to know all of the stuff that's going on from an employment perspective um, immigration coming into the city. So it's all about population, right? It's how many people are coming into the space versus how many people are leaving. So, um, so keeping on track of, you know, I know most, uh, MLS boards and, and real estate boards track a lot of that stuff. So, um, if you're not a realtor, then you, sh- you should be aware of a lot of that stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. And I think like you said before, it all, ladders back up to the business that's happening in the market. So if there are big employers moving in, like you want to keep your finger on the pulse. And what what I've heard from property managers uh, who do that effectively is they're always going out to events and they're following the people that are investors, that they're following people in the city whose job it is to bring in more rental housing units um, and to encourage developers to build. Um, They're staying on top of that by uh, looking at reports like the CAFR, which is the Comprehensive Annual Financial uh, Reports that municipalities have to put out each year in the states. And in addition to that, they're going out, they're going to events, and they're shaking hands, and they're they're following that money. They're trying to get a sense of where it's coming from at all times. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Some some other good people. Some other good people that you know that are really good contacts are. Um, people like architects, um, builders themselves. You you probably want to know who who are the main players in the multi-res building space. Um, bring them out for lunch, take them for a coffee, go on the job site and introduce yourself. Do whatever you can to be able to get in those guys' space um, because multifamily typically is going to be, it can be a little bit harder to get into that space. But once you've established yourself as an authority and expert, in that area, the relationships are gold. Um, they will be able to take you a long way and if you can prove yourself to them. All right. And another awesome tool for property managers looking to qualify the demand for multifamily management in their market is all property management, which is essentially like a marketplace service. Um, it allows property managers to see the owners that are looking for property managers in their direct zip codes where they do business. So if you're thinking about going into multifamily, you might want to just check out the zip code and see how many property owners or investors are looking for someone like you. Yep. Now, moving on, you know, the last step and one of the most important steps is you have to look at any expansion of your business or any entry, entry into a new part of your business as really a, a business plan. Um, and to look at yes. it in a way that you understand your profitability if you make certain investments and, uh, so how do you really know, like, first off, if, if adding more resources, like, how would you do it? If you, you say, okay, I want to get into multifamily, you know, I've got, a, I've got a couple of potential deals. Maybe you have, you know, you've shaken hands with a couple of people. You're about to ink a, a contract. Uh, how do you know that adding the resources to help support that business will, you know, really uh, pay for itself over a given amount of time? Well, w- one thing that I can almost for certain say is the first few depending on the size they're probably going to be not it's, it's very rare that you're going to hit home run on that first multi-res chances are on that first building or first two buildings there may be an, an investment required on your part to be able to staff up or do whatever you need to do to be able to onboard that property um, I, I was lucky enough to where myself and my partner um, we had enough experience and knowledge to where we knew all the components in, t- in terms of being able to take care of a larger building. Um, but some people may or may not have that. So um, if, if, I, if I were going to say, you know, where do I start? I think it's, it's got to be from the maintenance perspective. you you got to be prepared for the call or a call to come in any time of the day or night. Um, and have somebody, hopefully other than you, uh, be able to handle what's going on if there's an emergency or, or whatever the case may happen. So be ready to be called out to do just about anything at any time. Personally, as the owner, that's that's definitely something that you got to get prepared for. 
Um, having a key maintenance person, uh, whether if it's on staff or you're using a trade, um, is, is going to be critical. Um, and then it's really just a matter of assessing as you acquire more units, you're, you're going to see uh, a gradual stepping up of, okay, as you, you, you progress and you acquire more units, you're going to see that your staffing requirements are going to get higher. Um, we've, we've kind of always seen a, a, a 200 to 250 door count to where I'm usually having to add more staff to be able to handle it. That comes in terms of just administrative task, although we're seeing that go down a little bit with the, the with the invention of VAs and stuff like that. That's helping tremendously, and and some of the automation tools that are coming out, you know, with with building and, and everybody else. So that's awesome. Um, but yeah, just being, you just got to make sure that there's. So typically, the way that it works is you you, you get a building. It's gonna be it's gonna be pushing the envelope from a staff perspective and stress level in the office. Then you're gonna hire then your capacity is going to be more in terms of what you're managing. So you're going to go out and get more business and more business, more business. Everybody's going to be tapping out again. It's like, okay, we got too much, too much. <laughs> too much. Got, say got, uncle. Got hire. Yeah. We got to, we got to hire again and it's constant, you know, this constant teeter totter. Um, if, if you're somebody like me, that's constantly trying to grow. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the whole staffing component is, is definitely, the number one thing that you have to get straight. Right. And then I, w- I would imagine as well, onboarding becomes so important because you, when you get somebody, a new person, you want to get them ramped up quickly and, uh, you know, delivering the same level of service, you know, understanding and knowing all of the processes you have in place for your residents and your owners and just to be able to, to get them on board and, and helping the rest of the team as quickly as they can. Yeah. If, if there's any, if, if there's a, Great tip that I can recommend anybody if they're getting into a multifamily or they're just about to embark on their first multifamily, document everything that you do, every procedure, every system that you're following, like to a T. Because where we're at now, we've I find we've come to a certain size to where every time I try to onboard somebody, it's it's three to six months before they're productive. Um, they're they're just you know lost in the minutia of the details of this business. Um, I always get the same remark. It's like, wow, I never knew property management was so complicated and had so many systems and so many tasks and so many things that you have to remember. Um, knowing the address and unit number and tenant name of like a thousand people to, to some people in the property management becomes like second nature, but to other people, it's like you, you look like aliens to them when you start rhyming, naming the stuff off on a whim. Um, and I'm like, don't worry, it'll come. It just it just takes a while. You got to be around it for a bit. So there's a ramp up period of three to six months. That's good to keep in mind because if you're already feeling the feeling the pain a little bit and people are overworked, maybe it's a, you're already behind the ball a little bit. So it's good to know. Yeah, there's you can. I'm sure it could be done a lot better than that. Where I I gotta say, you know, that's probably one of our, our weaker points in terms of documenting and systematizing stuff. Um, we we fell in a trap the first five years to where we were in what I call my door chasing years to where it was just growth. That's, that's all we wanted. Just grow, 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 grow. And, and we did that very successfully, but at the detriment of kind of slowing down, sitting back and, and creating and documenting stuff so that it would make our lives easier after that, that was kind of always an afterthought and we're kind of paying the price for it now, but we're trying to fix it. Live and learn. Right. Um, so a couple yeah, more questions right. before, uh, before we close it out here. Now, how long do you think the the runway is for somebody getting into multifamily before they decide, you know what, this is definitely working. Um, and if they're making money and they're profitable, I'm sure that's not a hard question to answer, but say if they're not like, what's the, what's the runway they have in your mind? So before, before they'd start looking at, uh, onboarding the multi well, like say they're not getting right. They're not getting, uh, enough clients and they're kind of breaking even or they're just a little bit under it. You know, when do you kind of say like enough is enough? Let's try something else. I'd, I, I think before breaking into that, I, you know, I look at this, I don't know if it's a magic number, the whole 50 units, just having enough, enough units to say you're busy. Even 50 is kind of not a whole lot, but let's say a hundred. If you're a sole operator, it's just you and you may have somebody on the side helping you with books and, and, and a few other tasks, but 
you are mainly your business. At 100 units, you're, you're, you're probably, you're, you're busy. You're chugging along. There's probably some late nights, some stressful days, and kind of some hair pulling. Um, once you've been able to experience that, and you still want to move ahead and still continue and kind of like you're, you're in the business, then I think you're at a good point to where you could start look at pivoting into the multi-res area. So um, I just think you have to have a certain amount of experience before jumping into that realm um, and uh, just kind of getting your, you know, cutting your teeth a little bit with, with, with some good real environments, you know, in terms of stress and workload and overwhelm. Um, it just, it'll set you up well and you'll, you'll probably have a lot more success later on going through that. If you come into it too fresh and then all of a sudden you're, you're handed, a, a, a even a 12 unit building and, you know, five people move out all at once because that happens and it's like, okay, well, what do you do? You know, it's, and you get your, your owner calling you. It's like, you know, I got a 45% vacancy rate. I got to I got to redo all these apartments from a maintenance perspective. Expenses are going to go through the roof. The owner's not going to be happy. Like it's just it's a lot of stuff to think about. So be prepared for it. Yeah. Well, Tony LeBlanc, great speaking with you today. And uh, for those of you watching, we will have part two of this video series, uh, how to take on multifamily. And the next time we're going to be talking all about how to go after the new type of owner, the new type of multifamily owner or investor, because uh, it's very different. Uh, so until next time, Tony, it's great talking with you. Cool. Man. Thank you, Tony. Much appreciated. And uh, talk again soon.